So we'll start then. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Dear participants and guests, uh, good day and good afternoon to those who have already the afternoon. I would like to welcome you all today in our online keynote lecture um, by uh, Mr. Mason on uh, electronic evidence, a brief introduction to electronic evidence, which is organized by the council under the uh, implementation of the project um, strengthening the profession of lawyer in line with the European uh, standards, which is run under the PGG2 programming. Uh, for those who could not register for the event in advance, uh, the lecture will be live streamed on the website of the project um, that some of you know, uh, and it will be also available in the chat. So the, the link will be there. Uh, however, the live streaming will be only in English, but in our um, meeting today, we will have the possibility uh, to have the translation to Russian and vice versa. Um, you have all seen the program, so in brief, I will just give a small overview. We will start uh, uh, the meeting with uh, a welcoming speech by Ms. Lilia Gretersdottir. Uh, the head of our cooperation program division in the Department uh, for the Implementation of Human Rights, Justice, and Legal Cooperation Standards. It will be followed by a brief introduction on the topic by Dr. Rimigius Yukubauskas, and he will also introduce uh, Mr. Mason, who will then go and uh, give his lecture. Uh, we would like to ask you kindly to keep your questions. You can put them while Mr. Wilson Mason will be presenting in the chat or keep them for afterwards when he will finish the presentation. Um, after the first session, uh, we will have a small uh, break that will be followed by a fun uh, kind of quiz and there will be some prizes for the winners. However, for those who cannot attend that part, you can leave and of course we will uh, say goodbye and thank you to you after the first session. So now I think I will I will give the floor to Miss Lilia Greters, daughter. Distinguished participants, experts and guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Council of Europe, I'm delighted to join my dear colleague, Natalia, uh, in welcoming you all to this online event. And as Natalia already noted, this is organized by our regional project that focuses on strengthening the profession of lawyer in line with the European standards. The project, which is funded by the European Union and the Council of Europe within the PTD framework, covers five countries, namely Armenia, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. And it focuses in particular on strengthening the cooperation between bar associations and law societies to improve the internal functioning and independence of the bars. Obviously, of course, in line with Council of Europe standards and recommendations. Now I must say that we're delighted to see that this event is widely attended and we're expecting even more in just a minute. You are our partners from white and far, the representatives of bars and law societies of our diverse project countries. And your attendance here reaffirms the interest and the need to develop further the topic of electronic evidence. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being with us here today, because we all know this is a particularly busy, in fact, hectic period in many people's schedules as the end of uh, the year approaches. So it's great that you're here with us. Now, for those of you who are relatively new to this topic, we hope, of course, that this event will allow you to get familiarized with European standards, practices, experiences, and recommendations, as well as, of course, some of the key questions, challenges, and lessons learned. We obviously also hope that today, as Natalia noted, will give you a platform to raise your relevant questions and concerns, and to get responses to these 
in a concrete manner from uh, a world-renowned expert and experts who are speaking here today. Uh, now, as this is a pre-festive occasion, we also hope that you will be able to put potentially uh, join a, a jolly and fun quiz at the end, but no obligations. Um, now, just briefly, um, as you all know, of course, we are an institution that revolves around human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And as such, the Council of Europe has, of course, been active in producing work on electronic evidence in civil and administrative proceedings. Let me name one key seminal work um, in this field, which of course you will uh, hear more about in the course of the, of the day, namely the guidelines of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe on electronic evidence in civil and administrative proceedings. And this was adopted on the 30th of January uh, 2019 in fact, just before everything uh, closed down uh, and, and changed our lives uh, in the last years uh, due to COVID. Now, these guidelines constitute the first in international instrument in this field. And their primary purpose is to serve as a practical tool to our 47 member states and to support them in successfully adapting their judicial and other dispute resolution mechanisms in the context of electronic evidence. Now, the guidelines are this meant to facilitate the use of electronic evidence in court proceedings. Um, I would like to note as well that the guidelines are accompanied with a very rich and interesting explanatory memorandum that I am sure would be worthwhile for your uh, reading. And also I'd like to highlight that uh, the guidelines have been translated into Russian already in 2019. And these publications are available on the CTCJ website uh, the website of the European Committee on Legal Cooperation of the Council of Europe, as well as the website of our regional project. Uh, and I hope uh, a number of you are already familiar with that website. If no, and if not, then please use the occasion after this event. There is a lot of interesting material there. Now, in the context of COVID-19, which actually seems to be turning into COVID-19 2021 uh, and beyond. Um, we all know, of course, that electronic evidence, all things electronic, have become increasingly important. And this makes the guidelines in the Council of Europe engagement and work particularly relevant for national courts, uh, I would say, now more than ever. And as you will see better in the course uh, of our event today, the guidelines address a number of diverse issues. This includes such aspects as oral evidence taken by remote link and the collection, seizure, transmission, uh, and overall use of evidence, its relevance, reliability, storage, preservation, archiving, etc., as well as um, the overall awareness raising, reviewing, training, and education in the field. And we can, of course, say that in terms of awareness raising, this event here today is, is part of that um, overall approach. Now, there are, of course, as you all know, a variety of challenges relating to electronic evidence. Um, clearly, its use is more difficult. Um, at least for a number of course, as it requires special technical knowledge and understanding and know-how, et cetera. And there are other challenges, obviously, that I'm sure our experts will, will go into. But let me just add that our cooperation division, which is responsible for uh, a huge, huge part of cooperation programs with the Council of Europe on justice, legal cooperation and human rights, our division and in particular the project team, the, the team of the regional project that works both in Yerevan and in Strasbourg, 
we are ready to provide our further support and assistance in helping to incorporate the standards and the findings of the Council of Europe instruments into the legislative frameworks and practice of your diverse countries um, and obviously in our member states at large. And this is of course also why we think it's key to bring all of you together um, because ultimately of course you will be key players and are already key, key players in the field now and in the future. So I would just urge you to make use of this opportunity now to the fullest with the world-class uh, authorities and experts that we have with us um, today. On that topic, let me just join uh, my dear colleague Natalia in, in uh, welcoming in particular the great authority in the field, Mr. Siebel Mason, who as noted will give a keynote um, speech and introduction, and with them, Dr. Emigius Yoko Baskas, who has done extensive work with us here at the Council of Europe and beyond in the field. Now, I will not um, spend more of your precious time in the opening remarks because I know you're all eager to, to listen to our, our great experts here today. Let me just uh, take the opportunity to wish you all a successful and good closure to this uh, quite extraordinary year 2021. We are again now continuing to experience uh, uncertain COVID times, again, making all things electronic even more pertinent than before. Um, and then it's also appropriate to wish you all um, good health and well-being in the coming new year. And I certainly hope that our um, cooperation, collaboration and exchange will continue in a successful manner in the new year. So thank you for your attention. Welcome to this event, and we really hope you enjoy it and you find it fruitful and interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Lilia, for, for the wonderful speech. Um, I think uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to Dr. Jakubauskas. He will give a small introduction before uh, our lecture. Please, uh, Remigius. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Natalia, very much for a kind introduction. Thank you, Julia, for organizing this beautiful event. I think we can already say it's a successful event, but we have this chance to gather people from all across the Europe to meet and discuss a very important topic nowadays, which is electronic evidence. And uh, I think, well, we can all agree that electronic evidence has become a very important source in court proceedings. More and more electronic digital data is uh, being submitted to the courts to prove certain facts of the case. Uh, electronic evidence indeed is a very broad notion and uh, it can include a number of digital information. Um, it can take form of uh, text, video, photographs, um, audio recordings and so on. This digital data and court proceedings may derive from mobile phones, web pages, uh, computers, GPS recorders, data in clouds and so on. So we have indeed a vast, vast a uh, number of possible uh, sources of digital information which can be used in civil and administrative proceedings. And that's why discussions on use of electronic uh, evidence is indeed very important uh, nowadays. Uh, however, uh, as you can imagine, there are a number of serious issues which arise when dealing with electronic evidence. There are a number of those. Um, the most relevant ones, I would say, it is admissibility, reliability, relevance, submission of electronic data, of electronic evidence to the court, uh, submission of the original form of electronic information to the court is another challenge which the courts are facing in order to save metadata, not to lose important aspects of digital evidence. And I think there is no surprise that such an important topic as electronic evidence has drawn the attention of the Council of Europe for a few years. And this attention resulted in the adoption of the guidelines on use of electronic evidence in civil and administrative proceedings. Uh, actually, this document is now available on the internet, as it was said by Ms. Lilia, it was adopted in 2019, in January. And this document actually looks like this. 
So as you can see, it's a quite small book, actually. It has not so many pages, but indeed a very important information is there. So as a member of the drafting group of these guidelines, I would like to briefly tell you about the history of this document, how it was drafted and what is in there. So uh, actually the first step towards the drafting of the guidelines uh, was uh, the study uh, completed in 2016 by uh, Stefan Mason, our today's speaker, and Uwe Rasmussen. And uh, in this study, it was the comparative analysis of the regulation of electronic evidence in various countries of the European Convention on Human Rights. And according to the data found in this assessment, the draft of the guidelines was prepared. Actually, the drafting period took a few years when the guidelines were prepared. A number of meetings took place uh, by the representatives from various countries from the European uh, Convention on Human Rights in Strasbourg. And after a couple of years of drafting, this document was adopted by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. Uh, now, the guidelines uh, have certain structure. It consists of the preamble in which it is stated why this document was adopted, why is it important to adopt a certain document. Then it has purpose and scope, which explains the aim and goals of the guidelines, the definitions. There are a few definitions in the guidelines of the most important uh, aspects of electronic evidence. Definitely there is a definition of electronic evidence, of court, trust services, and a few others. Uh, also, there are three fundamental principles of treatment of electronic evidence established in the guidelines, which are like the main rules which can be used by the courts when dealing with electronic evidence, uh, such as the discretion of the assessment of the probative value of electronic evidence by the courts, equal treatment of electronic evidence, and non-discrimination of electronic evidence in comparison to other evidence. And then there are 35 guidelines the specific rules, how the court should deal with electronic evidence. And these rules relate to various aspects of electronic evidence. It relates to oral evidence taken by remote link, use of electronic evidence, collection of electronic evidence, relevance, reliability, also archiving, storage of electronic evidence. But I have to say that the guidelines only address the main questions related to electronic evidence. It does not uh, harmonize in any way the rules how the court should deal with electronic evidence. It is merely a practical guide, a practical instrument, how the courts and legal practitioners should uh, understand electronic evidence and should be aware of the possible issues which arise when dealing with electronic evidence. Also, I have to highlight that the guidelines, it's a soft law document. It is not a legally binding document, but it serves as a practical tool. And uh, I have to say that uh, we know that in court practice, courts from the member states of the European Convention on Human Rights have been already using the guidelines. For example, in quite recent case, the Court of Appeal of Lithuania has used the guidelines for interpretation of certain aspects of uh, electronic evidence. So it means that the guidelines have achieved this goal and now it's used by the court as a practical tool. Uh, also, uh, one more thing which definitely re relates to the collection of electronic evidence, particularly nowadays, is the right to private life. Uh, well, the right to private life and protection of private life and electronic evidence is collected, for example, when the monitoring of private com communication is uh, being conducted, is not uh, ex uh, in much extent regulated in the guidelines. However, it is clearly mentioned in the guidelines that electronic evidence should be collected in an appropriate manner. And definitely the guidelines were drafted in accordance with the European Convention on Human Rights and the case law of the European Court on Human Rights. Uh, of course, there are two main rights uh, related to collection of electronic evidence, which we can found in the convention, namely the right of fair trial, Article 6, and the right to private life, Article 8. And by using this uh, possibility to, to discuss electronic evidence, I would like to remind you about a few quite interesting and very relevant cases of the European Court on Human Rights, which were also uh, discussed uh, during the drafting of, of the guidelines and also have indeed significant importance when dealing with electronic evidence in practice. Uh, the first question, which I would like to remember, uh, remind you, is Barbulescu versus Romania, uh, the case uh, which even reached the Grand Chamber 
of the European Court on Human Rights in 2017. This is, I would say, it's the landmark case, because in that case, it was one of the first cases before the European Court on Human Rights, when the court dealt with the question, uh, is it legal when a private person collects information, digital communication of another person? Because in that case, uh, it was the situation when the employer uh, monitored electronic communication of the employee at the workplace for a couple of weeks. And it, it turned out that uh, the employee, Ms. Berbulescu, Bar in, in that case, uh, that uh, the employee was using um, the working with tools for communication with friends and family members, but not with clients as it was according to the employment contract. And the information found after this monitoring of electronic communication was used for the termination of the employment contract. So there were two basic questions uh, before the European Court on Human Rights. The first question is, is it legal when the private person monitors another private person and collects such digital communication? And then the logical question is this, so when is it legal if it's legal? So the court said, yes, it's legal in such case, then the private person monitored uh, electronic communication of another private person. But then the court, of course, had to answer the question, so when it is possible, under which circumstances? And the court, as you may know, established a number of criteria which can justify collection of such electronic data uh, there are seven, six steps actually established by the court, six criteria which have to be met always when such private monitoring is conducted. Uh, the major ones are, for instance, a clear notification prior to monitoring to the person, to the employee in, in, in that case, that the monitoring will take place. Also, it's important to have legitimate reasons for monitoring, justification for this, and so on. So there are a number of criteria which have to be met. Another quite important case in this regard is uh, the case of 2019, Lopez, Ribalda, and others versus Spain, in which uh, the court had to answer to the question, is it legal when the employer uh, monitors working activities of the employees by using hidden video cameras uh, at the workplace? Because in that case, it was a suspicion that employees are stealing money from, from the company, it was the shop, and it turned out uh, that indeed employees were doing so, and the employer uh, knew about this by uh, looking to the footage of the hidden video cameras about which the employees did not know, but uh, this monitoring is taking place. Uh, but in that case, the European Court on Human Rights said that uh, it is legal because it was a legitimate purpose. It did, this information, this electronic data collected was not used for any other purposes, so it was justified in this case. So as you can see, there are a number of interesting questions and aspects related to treatment of electronic evidence, how it should be legally collected, used, submitted to the court. And I am very, very glad that uh, today we have uh, Stefan Mason with us, uh, who is uh, definitely the leading scholar and the leading expert in the area of electronic evidence and electronic signature. I think, well, it will take maybe the half of how we went to present all the great achievements and, and uh, articles uh, prepared by Stefan Mason. So I will focus only on some of them. So uh, let me say that Stefan Mason is a member of the Bar of England and Wales well, since 1988. He's an associate research fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at School of Advanced Study at University of London since 2003. He's also been a visiting scholar uh, in the University of Singapore and University of Tartu in Estonia. He published a number of books and articles, but the most recent one, I believe, is the book on electronic evidence and electronic signature, the fifth edition of, of this book. And also Stephen Mason has established the Journal of Digital Evidence and Electronic Signature Law Review in 2003. So I, I believe you see there is no one more competent in this area of electronic evidence indeed than Stephen Mason. So I'm very, very glad that today we have Stephen Mason with us. And before I give the floor to Stephen Mason, I would like to say that uh, now we have a chance to actually give any questions to Stephen Mason uh, related to electronic evidence. Uh, please write your questions in the chat. 
if you could, please do not write long questions, just write uh, the more short questions you write, the better it will be for us to understand the questions and uh, assess them. Uh, but during uh, the presentation of Stefan and Mason, please uh, read all the questions which you may have regarding electronic signatures, electronic evidence, and we will discuss these questions after the presentation. So now I would like to give the floor to Stefan Mason and uh, Stefan Mason, the floor is yours. Just uh, turn on the microphone, Stefan, please. I think it's turned off. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you now, oh, perfect. Good. Perfect. Thank you very, well, thank you very much for a lovely introduction. That's very kind of you. It's very much appreciated. Um, what, what I, um, as a, an introductory comments, my first point is that I will try and um, keep my delivery fairly uh, slow uh, because uh, what I'm saying now is being translated into Russian by our translators. Um, so, uh, and I have no indication whether or not I will be traveling I'm speaking too quickly, so please bear with me. Uh, the second thing is Julia is going to actually change the slides for me and I will mention the change as, as we speak. Um, so thank you very much, Julia, for doing that for me. Um, I'm actually speaking at the moment on a smartphone, quite an old one. I, I'm sure some of you may think this should be in a museum now. It's the uh, 6SI, which I was given a few years ago by the um, authorities in Dubai when they asked me to go and speak at an event uh, between judges and prosecutors and lawyers, which was quite interesting. Uh, and they were having the same problems as we are all having the same problems across the globe with electronic evidence. Um, the, the also interesting thing is that um, the smartphone does not, you may be amused to know, it does not have a, a SIM card attached to it, which means there is no telephone number attached to the, the smartphone. Again, you might be quite amused because when I received the smartphone, I did not know what to do with it. I genuinely did not know what to do with it. Um, and uh, several people offered to buy it off me. Um, but I discovered that when I travel abroad, I can connect to Wi-Fi, of course, uh, and then use Skype to contact my telephone. Um, so that was quite nice. <laughs> so that's all I use it for. Um, uh, I, again, you, uh, you may be amused by that because of course, I, I'm uh, been writing about electronic evidence now for a number of years, uh, but um, the, the knowledge of electronic evidence does not equate with uh, how you use devices and, and evident uh, and electronic devices <laughs> generally. Um, so uh, um, please do put any questions in the box, um, uh, which we could then discuss the answers to and discuss them at the end of this particular formal part of the, the session. That would be great. Obviously, if we were um, all together in, in a single uh, place and being physically present, I would, um, enjoy um, being interrupted and, and, and answer questions and make points and discuss points um, at the point that they arise. But unfortunately, it, it is not practical to do that on this particular occasion. So uh, I'm sure all of us apologize for that. So my, my um, initial comments are that um, for those people who are listening um, now or will listen to the recording, um, you are prob some of you are probably very well aware of quite a lot of the issues relating to electronic evidence already. And if that is the case, please accept my apologies if um, I, I'm looking at um, this topic at a very high level of generality, which you might be aware of. Um, for those people who uh, are not familiar with the topic, then I hope this is a, um, a good general overview, uh, but it, we do not, for obvious reasons, look at, at everything because there is too much. Um, and has, as has been mentioned, um, our book, the fifth edition of electronic evidence and electronic signatures is available. Um, Professor Daniel Seng from the National University of Singapore and I co-edit that, and we also write a number of chapters as well ourselves. Um, and um, from the fourth edition onwards, we actually agreed to have it published online in a PDF for free. 
so you can download the whole thing uh, without cost if you don't want to buy a paper version uh, and I hope that is useful uh, of course it's only written in English um, but I'm sure at some stage if somebody wants to talk about uh, translating it I think that would be a very good idea um, the other observation to make um, before I, I look at this topic is that it, it is quite amusing to me as a, a common law lawyer uh, because I have done a lot of training of lawyers and judges and academics across Europe mainly with the Academy of European Law but also uh, the Council of Euro Europe have asked me to do various things as well which, I, which has been fun and I've appreciated it and it's been great to meet some people at the Council um, uh, and considering that electoral evidence itself is not a big um, point of contention for most lawyers in what we might loosely call civil jurisdictions uh, in comparison to common law jurisdictions, what is very interesting is that I've had more interest in this topic in Europe, uh, which has been really great, than I have in my own country, uh, which is really quite interesting. Uh, and this is illustrated in my own country with um, a, a big legal scandal that finally um, reached the law courts in 2019 with the British Post Office, who had an electronic system called Horizon. Um, I'm not going to go into that any, any, in any detail, but if you look on our journal, which is also an open source journal, in 2020, we published some articles about it. And last year, we all, or this year rather, I should say, we have published more articles and there are at least two or three more articles to be published in 2022. Uh, if you want to look at the disgraceful state of, of the way that lawyers and judges have reacted to electronic evidence in, in the UK, or certainly in England and Wales, uh, then it would be of interest for you to have a look at those articles if you're interested. Now, Julia, would you mind passing on to the next uh, slide, please? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an outline. The outline of my talk is just basically to give a, a general introduction. Uh, then we'll look at authentication and um, tied in with authentication, we'll look at the integrity of, of evidence. Um, and then, of course, we'll have some questions and hopefully a good dis discussion at the end before we finish before the break. Um, so, um, Julie, if you would now go on to the next slide for me, um, which is the need for a conceptual change. Uh, and as I I've said, I've done. Before, I've done already. Yes, we are yes, on you, the need for conceptual yep. change. Yes, thank you, Julia. Um, the um, as I explained before. Um, a lot of you will be familiar uh, with this now, but what? But for those who are not quite so familiar, it is quite useful to um, to try and think of evidence in completely different ways to what we call traditional evidence now. I think, which is of course paper, uh, mainly paper. Uh, we know, we all know about the information revolution. We now know that most documents only exist in the digital form. Uh, we still obviously print out paper and in many jurisdictions notaries not only notarize documents in physical form but they also notarize documents digitally as well um, but as you all probably recognize as well that electronic evidence has got very different characteristics to paper and one of the things that we have to grasp as, as lawyers and judges is that the normal rules of evidence relating to physical documents, um, mainly of course paper, um, have been in the past applied to electronic evidence as well. Uh, and that is a bit of a problem because the paper version of a document uh, in comparison to an electronic version uh, does not equate very easily at all and one can get uh, misled if you try to equate the paper method of authentication to the electronic method of authentication. So what I'm trying to say, obviously, which I say in the slide there, is that the rules, the rules that we've established for paper and we're very familiar with no longer apply to the evidence in electronic form. 
And of course, it has unique characteristics, as we probably all know. Um, so to, actually, in, in theory, complex questions about the integrity and the security of the evidence can be erased when you're examining how to authenticate electronic evidence if it is necessary to authenticate, of course. That's the most important thing to think about. And let's try to remember to come back to that at some later stage. So Julia, if you would take me to the next, the next slide, please. Um, and one of the things that um, we're all familiar with as lawyers and judges is the concept of the original document. Now, normally one can have a, a contract uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as one example, it could be an employment contract or it could be a commercial contract between one or more legal entities to supply goods and services or goods or services. And obviously in the paper environment, we are used to having perhaps one original copy. So I am familiar with the way that contracts are entered into in Italy, for instance, where a notary will negotiate it, a notary will draft it, and a notary uh, will retain the original copy of the contract in their possession. And then two copies will be given, two certified copies will give, be given one to each par party. And if there is a, um, a dispute about the contract terms, then you go to the original document held by the notary. Uh, you may be familiar in common law countries, what tends to happen is that you, if there are two parties, you might produce two precisely exact copies of the document on paper, and then each party will sign both documents. Um, and therefore, each copy is an original. Um, so we have a slightly different tradition in, in England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and, and also in other common law countries. But it does not matter because we are talking about originals. Now, the, the issue about uh, the original um, electronic document arose very early on. And I wrote a paper in 2009 on this particular issue when I gave a, a lecture in Japan on the topic. Um, it is a free download if you want to read it. But um, the point I want to make about electronic evidence is that we, we tend not to be talking about original. I used to have a lot of discussions with lawyers um, some 10 years ago, uh, where lots of lawyers uh, kept on insisting that there would be the original electronic document. So let's take for an example, uh, an exchange of emails. If I send an email to Natalia, um, which copy is the original? Is it the one that is held on my computer or is it the one held on Natalia's computer? There are two copies of the same document. The different, the, but there is a difference between the two. The difference is that the one Natalia has received includes additional metadata, which demonstrates how it got to her computer. Uh, and so therefore, in terms of authenticity, it's very helpful to be able to establish that actually Natalia actually received the document or the email in question. But the point is, there are two emails, the content, the content of which is identical, but the metadata which is different. So one could argue there are two originals in existence, but that, that of course means uh, that the concept of original no longer exists because essentially original tends to be um, just the single document. So my, my, my observation is that if we accept that all digital data is a copy of a copy and maybe of a copy, then uh, we, we can think about authentication in a different way to the authentication of a contract, for instance. So what we do need to think about is what um, I've called, um, together with other people I've discussed this with, first in time evidence. Uh, by that I mean, 
if, um, if to take it out of the civil context just for the moment, if you're a, um, a police officer and you have seized uh, somebody's computer uh, in the investigation of a crime, for instance, then the, the hard disk of the computer is the physical item upon which all of the data is stored. So as that is the first in time that the police seized the, document, the, the computer together with the hard drive, one can say for evidential purposes, when it comes to authenticity, authenticity that that is the first in time iteration of the evidence that came into the possession of the police. And then from that moment onwards, if the authenticity of the evidence is in dispute, then uh, the police will have to demonstrate the integrity of the evidence from the moment that they ob obtained uh, and seized the evidence. So that's just, just one example. Um, I think uh, certainly in more recent years, um, most people have now begun to accept that um, th this is as, a, as a, a realistic proposition rather than uh, um, insisting uh, that there must be an original in electronic form. Uh, just to extend this discussion slightly more, if you think about taking a photograph on a smartphone, and then uploading the, the smart the photograph to an internet website and maybe even sending copies of it to other people then the question becomes which is the original okay arguably it could be the one on the smartphone but what if you delete it then what becomes the original and, uh, and in theory if we think about paper versions, then the original has been destroyed or deleted. But all of the other copies are precise copies of the uh, photograph to begin with, albeit one advantage in electronic form is that they will all have additional metadata attached to them where they were sent. Um, so one could say that this is just a copy of the original uh, but on the other hand, we have additional information which allows us to establish whether or not the photograph uh, was sent to other people. And in paedophilia cases, that's very useful, of course. So, Julie, if you would pass on to the next slide, please, for me, and we look at the definition. Thank you very much. Um, as has been mentioned before, um, the Council of Europe have a definition. Um, uh, but uh, Professor Burkhard Schaefer and I um, refined the very first def definition, which I devised in 2007 for the first edition of the book. Um, and we have the definition on the slide now, which I won't read. We have tried, we discuss the meaning of the def def definition in, in the book. Uh, but in, in essence, we've tried to be as comprehensive as possible, uh, covering all forms of electronic data. Um, interestingly, there was a very interesting, um, if you're not aware of it, European project, and I give you the URL on this slide, the evidence project, which um, I was invited to take part in and, and speak at various events. I did not actually take part in the uh, provision of the documents relating to it, but in, in their um, D3 paper, they actually look at um, various definitions that they, they found across the world, and they produced a definition themselves, which is actually very similar or almost identical to the one uh, that Burkhard and I um, had refined over the years. Um, so, but as far as definitions and definitions are concerned, it's probably unlikely that really we need them much in, in, in legal proceedings anyway, uh, mainly from my perspective, because um, we, we know what electronic evidence is. Um, it, when it's presented, it's obvious whether or not we have to think about a de definition is fine in theoretical perspective, um, and may occasionally be needed 
to, to prove a point in, in legal proceedings, uh, but generally speaking, I, I think we probably all know what it is, but nevertheless, having a, de a definition is quite useful. So Julia, if you would pass on to the next slide, which is some cha challenges, thank you. And as it was mentioned earlier in the instruction, um, uh, some, obviously we, there's all sorts of challenges that can be made uh, to electronic evidence by um, your opposing party or somebody who is making a claim. And I've listed some of them here. These are by no means all of them. Obviously a claim that records are altered, manipulated or damaged, uh, which probably happens more frequently than we like. Um, also the reliability of the computer program, uh, because that may be questioned. And that is certainly part of the case in the post office, the um, UK post office horizon case, uh, which um, came to trial in 2019. Um, that was quite a significant issue because in England and Wales, there is a legal presumption that computers are, are reliable. And for those people who have downloaded our book, uh, you will notice there's a complete chapter on this presumption and the chapter has been devised or I devised it um, in, and wrote it in 2010 for the second edition to demonstrate that um, this presumption is incorrect. Um, and so far this case has also demonstrated how incorrect it is, although we do not see any move by the English um, Parliament or the judiciary to make any changes to this presumption yet. Also, the identity of an author might be in dispute, or maybe the person that used the mobile telephone. Quite often, when there's an accident, um, some people will claim they were not using their mobile telephone while they uh, were engaged in, in causing an accident um, in a motor vehicle. Um, but also social networking websites, um, that is quite frequent now. Um, maybe some of you listening to this now are involved in family and divorce matters and specialize in those areas. If you do, you are probably familiar with using or gaining access to social media websites to prove one or other of the divorcees have been having an affair with somebody uh, which demonstrates the proof uh, as to why uh, they should be divorced. And also ATMs, um, especially um, banking generally, banking has suffered quite badly from increasing amounts of theft, both to internet banks and also ATMs, and using the password or the PIN uh, to establish entry into a, an ATM and then stealing money. Uh, that can be a big issue. Uh, and it certainly continues to be, even though we have a much uh, stronger um, mechanism now, because of course, in Europe, every card has a digital signature attached to it. Um, but even that can be evaded by thieves. Um, so that uh, continues to be an issue. Oh, right, if Julia, if you would pass us on to authentication, please. Thank you very much. Um, so when we think about authentication, uh, again, for those people who are, are familiar with the book, you will know that there's a, an entire chapter on authentication. Um, I initially wrote that uh, for the first edition and um, Dr. Alison Stanfield from Australia joined me um, as a co-author of the chapter. And for this fifth edition, um, Professor uh, Luciana uh, Durante from uh, Canada, who is a well-known uh, specialist um, and world leader in archiving of digital data, agreed to join uh, Dr. Stanfield in writing uh, or essentially rewriting our, our um, chapter on authentication. And for uh, anybody that is interested in this topic, um, I would recommend that chapter. It's a very good chapter. It, um, it takes a global perspective, not just a common law perspective. And um, Professor uh, Luciana 
is an it, uh, Italian um, uh, working in Canada, although she is a Canadian citizen as well. So she has uh, at heart uh, the great notary tradition of, the, of, the, of, of Europe and Italy in particular. Um, so it's well worth looking at. But the point is that it might be necessary to lay down the evidential foundations of the evidence before it's accepted into legal proceedings. Now, this, of course, is different to admissibility, which we're not going to look at. Um, so what I want to give you is, is an example from England and Wales. So in civil proceedings in England and Wales, there is a, a procedure of the civil court. So it's not law, but it's a procedural requirement that, um, first of all, you have to disclose to the other party all of the evidence that is in your favor, but also all, the, all of the evidence which is against you as well. That's a requirement. And if you fail to do so, there can be sanctions against you. So there comes a, a time in the proceedings if you do not settle before litigation begin or before the trial begins, that uh, you have to exchange all of the evidence with your opposing party. And what at this particular stage, what happens is that there is a procedural rule that states that at the stage that you exchange your documents, both parties, if there are only two parties, accept the authenticity of all of the evidence the other party is putting forward. Now, the purpose of this is obviously to reduce the amount of time spent in challenging any, any form of evidence, including electronic evidence, at trial. The aim of the trial is to reduce um, the discussion down to those issues that are in dispute, not peripheral issues, which makes it, of course, cheaper for the participants, and it's cheaper, obviously, for the um, justice system, and it makes it shorter. So at this stage, when you exchange documents, you have got 14 days to inform the opposite party whether or not you dispute the authenticity of any of the evidence, and if so, what evidence you dispute. Now, if you do dispute some of the evidence and you put the, the party on notice that they must authenticate it, then that's what they must do during trial they must actually authenticate the evidence first. As you can imagine, in English um, civil proceedings, this very rarely happens. Uh, invariably, in um, the vast majority of cases, everybody accepts the evidence put forward. Uh, it is very rare for them to challenge the authentic authenticity of the evidence. It does occur occasionally, and it does obviously occurs more frequently with electronic evidence, but still most electronic evidence is accepted without the need to authenticate. Obviously the authenticity of the evidence might be the subject of challenge during trial. Um, and I'm sure some of you will have, will recognize this as well. And that is suddenly in cross-examination, um, one of the witness, witnesses will say, well, actually, I didn't actually write this. And then, of course, the authenticity of the document might be subject to discussion and further proceedings. Uh, but that also is quite rare. So, Julia, if you wouldn't mind taking us to the next slide, please, for trustworthy. Thank you very much. So when it comes to um, evidence in electronic form, <clears throat> we don't have the physical piece of paper with the physical documents on it. And of course, with the physical signatures, naturally um, you will say, well, sometimes um, signatures are forged, which they are of course. Um, and then in a physical environment, it will be necessary to ask for the uh, expertise of um, a professional in, in signature handwriting to establish whether or not signatures were forged or not. But in electronic uh, data, we can't do that easily. So we look for something, uh, evidence which is trustworthy. So what do we mean by that? Well, um, it's obviously, obviously 
um, a word that probably um, means what it says it means, do we, does the electronic data in front of us, does it deserve to be trusted? Do we entrust our confidence or are we confident that it is actually the document that was um, sent or received, for instance? When it comes to the concept of trustworthiness, we've got two qualitative dimensions. The first one is reliability. Can the, let's say it's an email just for the sake of argument, can the email demonstrate that it is capable of standing for the facts to which it attests? Is it accurate? And then authenticity. Is the record of what is the record what it claims to be? So is the email in question something that was sent by a witness and received by another witness? So basically the term authentic is uh, not surprisingly uh, used to describe whether the document or data are genuine. Um, and that in the case of digital data, it matches the claims and made um, about it. Uh, that's what we're talking about when it comes to the term trustworthy. So Julia, if you would move on to testing for authenticity, thank you very much. So how do we test for authenticity? Well, this is my view, which um, is generally accepted certainly by the authors, authors, the authors of our text is that it depends on the source of data and the type of data. Um, so consideration should be given to a number of those measures, which you can see before you now, um, which have been usefully translated into, Russia's, into Russian, which obviously includes the procedures, processes, technical measures, um, and of course also the use of digital signatures if, um, if they are used. So all of these, um, aspects which we of course we discuss in much greater detail in the book um, help provide for the authenticity of the digital data but also the way that people interact with computers and computer systems this can also be be quite important and there are certainly a number of cases from the United States of America where the way that people are made to interact with computers have um, made the evidence unreliable, which is quite interesting, especially in terms of contracts of employment. Uh, I don't know about your jurisdiction, but in America now, it is very widespread that employees have to enter an employment of contract electronically. And sometime, and some of the case law from America uh, demonstrates that actually a lot of there are examples where people have actually set up systems and made employees interact with computers which actually do not achieve the objective that they achieve, they intend. So the means of authentication might well depend on where the whether the data comes from, which device the data comes from, whether it comes from a computer or a smartphone whether it's the internet, and of course, you'll be familiar with cloud services. Is it from a cloud service? Um, and apart from the substantive issues of where the cloud service actually physically is, the question is, can we trust the data from the cloud service and email and so on and so forth? Now, I've got some examples here, Julia, if you would pass on to the next slide, which is example one. Thank you very much. This is, um, as you can see from the date, quite an old case uh, in, in um, terms of electronic evidence dating from 2007. And the facts, of course, uh, date uh, to before 2007, because this is the date of the case reporting. It's quite an interesting case, though, which some of you uh, may be struggling with now. Um, but before I discuss the case, let me explain. <clears throat> in civil cases in France and also in Belgium, to my knowledge, 
if you um, are a party to litigation and you wish to adduce evidence, uh, you must do so through a neutral third party. And in both France and Belgium, you do it through a bailiff. And bailiffs are used to, um, certainly were, were used to, um, dealing with physical evidence, obviously. But when it comes to electronic evidence, um, they were on a rapid learning curve, as of course we all are, uh, and we continue to be so as well. So in this case, this was uh, an issue about intellectual property rights. Uh, I don't think um, the facts of the case really are relevant, but one party introduced uh, evidence through a bailiff as to the uh, intellectual property rights being misused. Um, but when um, the party to whom it was addressed against objected, it transpired that the bailiffs had used a computer with um, quite a lot of um, data on it already. So they did not use a clean computer, they used a computer which had already been used quite a lot. So the claim by the party um, to which the data was addressed against said, well, how, how can you tell that all of this data you're bringing forward is authentic because there's so much other data on this hard disk uh, that it's all intermixed. Um, so how can we trust the integrity and the how can we say this is authentic data? And the judge decided uh, that the data would not be accepted in legal proceedings. They, they said it was not sufficiently authentic for the very reason that the bailiffs had used uh, a computer with data already on it. Now, um, superficially, this seems to be quite an, um, a, 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 seems to be a correct decision, but I would, I would dispute it partly um, because if you had um, a proper forensic specialist look at the computer, they should be able to sift out the old data on the computer and establish the, the, um, the data relating to the intellectual property uh, dispute. And they should be able to establish what was authentic and what was not, and what was old and irrelevant and, and what was relevant for the case. Nevertheless, this is the case that um, that actually changed the way bailiffs uh, dealt with these issues, certainly in France and Belgium. And um, the article by Tim Van Kaniat and Christopher Verdieu is worth reading if you're interested. It's uh, online for free. So thank you, Julie. If you would pass on to example two, please. Thank you. Now, uh, this second example is what I call simple electronic evidence, which is actually email evidence. Um, for the purposes of illustration, um, it's quite a useful case, although it happens to be a criminal, a criminal case from England and Wales. But I hope you will accept um, that this is quite a useful example of how it works. So in this case, the appellant was convicted of making a, a threat to kill. And part of the evidence was this email he sent to um, the victim, who was his wife on the 31st of July, 2002, where he said, hi, bitch, don't think you're safe in the UK. I'm going to kill you. I will make sure I get my hands on you, we're waiting for you. And then those words, your loving husband, Riz. Um, quite a nice thing to say to your wife, I'm sure. Um, not. Um, now, to put this into context, this is one email uh, amongst a lot of other evidence that was presented to the trial judge. Uh, and a lot of the evidence was phys physical witnesses who came forward, including his wife, to say that he had threatened her in various situations over long periods of time. So this, is, was, this was only one piece of evidence or, um, on, in, in electronic form 
but it included a lot of um, evidence um, by physical witnesses as well. So it was not um, a singular, single piece of evidence that went to show uh, the threats that he was committing. So if you would pass on to the next one, please, Julia. Thank you. So at trial, a witness for the defense gave evidence, first of all, to demonstrate how easy it was to produce a document that claimed to be an email, to make it look like an email, but which had nothing to do with the email account from which it came. Now, um, I, I don't know physically how to do this myself, but I do understand it is quite easy to uh, make an email appear as if it's come from your email uh, system. Uh, but of course, it's not that easy, as we all know. And the de defense suggested that somebody else was responsible, responsible for sending the email in question. Now, if we can go to the next slide, please, Julia. At a, um, this chap appealed, which is why we know um, of the facts of the case and we had the judgment. Um, one of the grounds of appeal at the Court of Appeal Criminal Division was that it was necessary, the defendant, or the appellant rather, the appellant argued it was necessary to provide evidence of the audit trail or similar evidence to demonstrate the authenticity of the documents. Now, in normal circumstances, one would say, yes, I do understand that. I understand that. If the document is in dispute, then this is something we, we should be dealing with. However, the members of the Court of Appeal rejected this submission. So Julia, if you would go on to the next slide, please. So why did they do that? Thank you very much. Well, they said, actually, this particular email did not have to be authenticated in the way suggested by the appellant. And this was because of the circumstances that surrounded the events and the other evidence. So as I mentioned before, there was lots of other evidence of different types to demonstrate that he was um, threatening to kill his wife. And the Court of Appeals said, well, the content of this email is similar to other evidence produced at trial. So this, this actually was sufficient for the Court of Appeal to say, well, actually, this, because of the other evidence, it went to show that the appellant actually wrote and sent this email. So the finder of fact, in this case, the members of a jury in England and Wales, had to consider whether in all circumstances, it was possible that somebody else produced this email. So one could argue, well, in a population of 60 million people in England, who wanted to kill this man's wife? And the answer is only one person as far as we know. So the Court of Appeal said the content, the content itself of the email demonstrated its authenticity, taking into account all of the evid other evidence of a similar nature at trial. And they, they continued to say, well, look, if the email was fabricated, which the defense suggested it might be, it has to be questioned as to why somebody who does not know the appellant went to the length of forging the email, uh, the content of which was so obviously linked to the other evidence in the trial. Now, I'm not sure if necessarily everybody listening to this would agree with the outcome of that particular decision of the Court of Appeal, where they said it was not necessary to authenticate the email. But from a practical point of view, um, I, I agree with the, the reasoning of the Court of Appeal. Uh, there's no reason I can see uh, why we should disagree with it. Uh, but certainly if people do think it's wrong, um, 
and the decision ought to not to have been made that way. Uh, let's discuss that um, after I my, finish my formal piece. Um, that would be quite interesting. So Julie, if you would go on to the next slide for me, uh, the integrity of data, thank you very much. So um, clearly, both in the chapter on authentication of electronic evidence, but also we have another chapter called Proof, um, which is written by uh, lawyers as well as technicians. There are a number of things that we want to talk about which are covered in these chapters relating to the integrity of the data. And um, we've got a series of questions here which, are, which we've devised. Uh, and I, I have um, to thank uh, Professor um, uh, Martin Thomas, CBE, for um, proposing these. And I, I have slightly tweaked them. Um, uh, but without him, I, we, we wouldn't have achieved these particular questions. But they are, they are a very useful guide in, in whatever legal system uh, we operate in regarding electronic evidence. So the question is, what confidence can we have that the evidence accurately represents the facts that they are purported to represent? So then we've got these three questions then. It leads to three questions. First one, was there a trustworthy source of information that accurately reflected the facts? Hopefully in, in many cases, it will be quite clear, but if not, it may be that um, a digital evidence professional will be able to establish that by using uh, technical uh, software to be able to establish whether or not they can trust the source of the information. And where evidence is in dispute, that probably will be necessary. So then, then once you've got an answer to that question, the next question is, if there is a trustworthy source of data, is the evidence that you present in legal proceedings generated without error from that source of information? Now, this can be important because, as I'm sure a number of you will know uh, listening to me now, uh, as a result of your own experience, that the evidence might have been manipulated inadvertently from being copied to being presented in, in legal proceedings. So we have to be aware of that possibility. And then finally, with question three, if, um, it, if the evidence was generated without error, the next issue is, has the integrity of the evidence been preserved between the time the data was collected to the moment you rely on it in legal proceedings. Um, and this is particularly uh, um, relevant in criminal proceedings, but equally as relevant in civil proceedings. So once the evidence is seized, can you actually, um, are, are the systems in place such that the evidence has not been altered from the moment it was seized to the moment you're looking at it in legal proceedings? I hope um, for those people who are familiar with electronic evidence, uh, you, you may think this is quite a, a good a set of questions to ask. Um, and certainly, if you have experience of this, uh, please do uh, share it with us. That would be really super. So if we can go on to the next slide, please, uh, Julia. Thank you very much. So how, what sort of thing we should be looking at when it comes to authentication? Well, there are obviously a number of considerations. It differs according to the nature of the evidence to be authenticated, where the evidence is to be found, and the local rules of evidence for obvious reasons. The evidence from a mainframe computer will be different from the evidence from a domestic laptop or a smartphone. Uh, I've got obviously the means of authentication will depend on the individual rules of the jurisdiction. And incidentally, um, that is why in, in forming, forming the first draft convention on electronic evidence, which we include as an appendix in the book, but also it's av available freely online 
in the journal from 2016, we make these points that everything is predicated on what the local jurisdiction rules are. Uh, there are there was no attempt in the draft convention on electronic, electronic evidence to make the convention um, specific to any one legal system. It is generic. There's no attempt whatsoever to say this is what common law does. Uh, that's irrelevant. What is relevant is how we can deal with electronic evidence regardless of our legal culture or legal system and of course in the majority of cases uh, oral and circumstantial evidence is, is is sufficient for most now julie if we can go on to the complex electronic evidence thank you very much i'm not going to discuss this in any great detail um, complex electro electronic evidence for instance evidence from a mainframe can banking system is going to take much more than what I discussed this morning. Uh, there's a two phase approach in, um, in the book at, at the paragraph 5.26. And this is taken from an article of which you can download if you're interested there. And uh, we also have a link to the draft conventional electronic evidence uh, article four if, you, if you're interested in looking at it. Um, incidentally, on this draft conventional electronic evidence, I'm going to suggest that we think about updating it to version two and initiate that next year. But I will let um, the council know and invite anybody across the world to help um, work on a second version on that one. So, Julia, if you would go on to the next slide for me, please. Thank you. The integrity of the evidence. I'm now finishing my talk. Um, and uh, this is the last slide, effectively. <clears throat> so one of the issues uh, is whether or not the integrity of the evidence has been preserved between the time the data was collected and the moment it is relied on in legal proceedings. Well, I've got two cases here, one from Estonia and one from China, uh, which you might find of interest. In the in Estonian case, um, the part, one of the parties challenged the use of an MD5 hash, because they said uh, that the MD5 hash had been broken, and therefore, um, by using the MD5 hash, uh, the authorities um, meant uh, that you could not rely on the evidence. As a matter of interest for you, um, I was actually asked to give evidence in this case by uh, the person who was accused. Um, they wanted me to um, be an expert witness, but I, I explained to them that um, I, I couldn't be uh, unless the jurisdiction agreed, uh, which they didn't, which is fair enough. But the, 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 the court held that uh, just because an MD5 hash had been broken, it did not follow that you could not rely on the evidence. And, and we have a, this detail in, in the journal if you're interested. And in China, as you can see from 2018, blockchain, as far as I'm aware, was used for the first time ever um, to, uh, for, for the, the purpose of authenticating the evidence. Again, uh, if you want to look at that case, uh, that would be quite interesting, I think. So, Julia, if you would just pass on to the next slide, which is topics not in, discussed. There's a whole list of topics there, of course, that we can't discuss today, which are obviously included um, in the book, if you're interested. Um, and with the next slide, Julia, if that's all right with you, um, um, English translations of the Belgian Yahoo case. Um, that particular one um, is very interesting. It's an issue about um, uh, who uh, is... Um, there was a... a, a, a um, a criminal case in, in Belgium uh, where uh, jurisdiction was an issue uh, and um, I won't go into any, any detail other than say this was a quite an interesting jurisdictional case which uh, I highly recommend you look at and last but not least um, I have a slide there for questions if you wouldn't mind passing on to that Julia um, and I'm open to questions now so Uh, so thank you, Stefan, very much indeed for your very detailed presentation. 
I think you actually mentioned the main aspects of electronic evidence, and indeed you focus most on authenticity and integrity of electronic evidence, which is by far these questions are one of the most relevant when the courts have to deal with electronic evidence. And uh, I see we are now having more and more questions in the chat. I just once more would like to encourage you all to write your questions in the chat. Also, if you just would like to share your experience dealing with electronic evidence or from your jurisdiction, you see that you know there are some interesting peculiarities regarding the regulation of electronic data electronic evidence or how the courts use electronic evidence. So please feel free to share uh, with us uh, about it today because, well, this is not a formal lecture, but this, this, this is a discussion. So we would really like uh, to hear your opinion, your experience when dealing with electronic evidence. And uh, I would like to actually then begin our question session uh, with some questions which we already have in, in our chat. And uh, the first question actually relates uh, very much to what you, what Stefan, what you have already discussed, it's authenticity of electronic evidence. And the question is this, so uh, can we use uh, chat messages, for example, in chat of in WhatsApp, Facebook or other messengers uh, and how to identify, how to authenticate the persons who wrote messages in the chats of some social media accounts and, and other communication tools, which we have. So the question is about authenticity, how we can establish authenticity in such case. Yes, that, that's, um, uh, that issue has a, arisen, um, I think for, for the first time in both Canada and America. And I think it's also arisen in England and Wales as well now. It is quite a difficult problem actually. Because as you say, there, there are two issues here. There is the issue of the authentication of the data taken off the chat uh, to start with, um, which you can only, you, you have to um, ask a digital evidence professional to help you with that particular aspect of it. But the other issue quite rightly is whether or not um, somebody asserts that they are not the pseudonym being used in the chat. And this has arisen several times in litigation, mostly in criminal litigation and family litigation in both Canada and the United States of America. In, and judges uh, usually have to uh, assess the evidence before it goes to trial, uh, before it goes to the jury. Um, for those who are not familiar with um, legal proceedings in front of a jury, it's, as you will know, uh, probably it's the jury that decides whether somebody is, uh, has or has not committed the offence and therefore is guilty or not guilty. Uh, but there are occasions when issues relating to the authenticity of the evidence, for instance, is discussed in the absence of the jury because the jury are not permitted under common law systems to listen to every argument of a technical nature. So you have an argument before a judge, a, a judge then issues a ruling and then the jury are told what the judge uh, has decided in regards to the evidence. So in cases where it's, there are less cases dealing with the authenticity of the evidence, normally chat rooms are relatively um, acceptable, but the real issue is, um, of course, whether or not uh, the names or handles that are being used by those people in the chat room, whether or not they are the people um, um, that are making the comments. So there are two ways of approaching this. Uh, the first one is if you've seized the computer of the uh, perpetrator, or the person alleged to have committed the crime, then there should be sufficient technical evidence on the computer to demonstrate that they entered into the chat room uh, and when they left it, so that you can infer that they, the, they were the ones that were actually communicating in the chat at that material time. And a second, a second piece of evidence that helps is whether they have used a particular name or handle, as it's called, um, on other occasions, and 
there is evidence to demonstrate from other people that they are associated with this particular name or hand handle. So if I entered, if I was well known um, for using Santa Claus as a handle in chat rooms, uh, then the evidence would be, well, you probably did it. <laughs> um, uh, although I don't use chat rooms as myself or any social media, but um, that, that's an example. Uh, um, it, 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 is a, it is a real difficulty. I'm sure everybody is facing that problem right now. And also, as Stefan, you mentioned the presentation, we have to look to the content of, of, of the data, of the evidence, and other evidence which may surround. Yes. That, that, that specific electronic data, which may prove the authenticity. And uh, also Ivan would, would like to see what's written in the guidelines regarding the authenticity. So uh, in the guideline 21st, it's written that as far as a national legal system permits and subject to the court's discretion, electronic data should be accepted as evidence unless the authenticity of such data is challenged by one of the parties. So the idea behind this rule, and it was quite uh, debatable, I think, during the drafting process, that uh, authenticity actually, well, it almost has to be, I believe, presumed unless other party challenges it. So the court not always has to take the active role in the analysis of the authenticity of the part of electronic data, unless you no, know, the other party claims that the authenticity is disputable. Yes, that's correct. That's certainly correct in, in English civil proceedings, uh, but it, it's also becoming relatively normal in criminal proceedings as well. So uh, let's, because so, I used to be at the criminal bar way back in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, um, for those people who are familiar with criminal law um, and, and maybe even criminal lawyers themselves, um, you will have a defense from your from the person you're representing. They will tell you what their defense is, and you will obviously scrutinize that. Now, often in criminal trials, the defense do not challenge the authenticity of the evidence. And many technicians say to me, well, this evidence could have been challenged. Why didn't they challenge it? Uh, and my response is, well, um, the defense had a particular mode of defense which did not challenge the evidence it challenged other things as part which the prosecution were putting being putting forward uh, and so there is no point in the defense challenging the authenticity of the evidence because you're only going to uh, annoy the judge and perhaps even annoy the jury uh, which is not the point of your defense um, and it's if it's irrelevant then of course you, you should not be challenging it anyway um, mm -hmm. Does that sort of re respond to the question as such? Yeah. 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 Uh, good. Uh, another question which we have also in the chat is, I, I will read this question because it's quite a detailed one. So in a situation of a cross-examination of the witness living abroad, uh, can we consider the written record of the questioning of the witness as an authentic and trustworthy digital evidence instead of the video recording of the questioning of the witness? So I think uh, the, the question relates, can we say that we have the same quality of authenticity of the document when we have uh, like a written statements from the witness and uh, instead of video recording, uh, how a witness explained the situation, for instance? Well, that, that's a very interesting point, actually, because um, the evidence now, which is um, has been accepted in um, the UK for many decades is that um, our memories, our, each of us have a bad memory. We do not have clear memories. And uh, some of you uh, listening to this now may be familiar with the Gorilla film where um, some psychologists, I think in America uh, at a university, what they did is they, uh, they took a film of um, people milling around in, in outside a building, lots and lots of people. And walking through the film was a gorilla, a man or woman dressed up in a, a suit of a gorilla. And then they asked people who looked at the film a few minutes later to uh, tell them what was in the film. 
And most people had not noticed the gorilla walking through <laughs> the people. Now, they were looking at this film without stress in front of a, a monitor, perfectly relaxed. Now, if when you're relaxed, you don't notice something as substantial as a human being walking past you in a gorilla uh, um, outfit, the question is, when you're under stress and you witness something, either an accident or somebody being assaulted, are you really going to notice the colour of the vehicle? or the fact that somebody wore spectacles, or they had a beard, or they didn't have a beard, or they wore a hat. So these are the, some of the significant problems with our memory. That's not to say that a witness is deliberately lying to us. Uh, it's just that they are, they are misremembering, and they may, not, may or may not be remembering what they saw. So then we take this one stage further, as the questioner asks, about um, assessing evidence between being in court in person and giving evidence or being on a, a, a remote platform and giving evidence from another jurisdiction uh, in the same way that we are taking part in this event online right now. And again, the evidence demonstrates uh, certainly from the point of view whether or not a witness is lying, that judges do cannot tell um, whether somebody's lying or not. There's a 50-50 chance that you can tell somebody is lying, which of course it, it are no odds at all. And uh, you then can project that obviously uh, to somebody online. And the question is, would this be the same? And a famous example, of somebody giving evidence um, via video link was President Clinton when he was um, challenged over um, sexual affairs with Monica Lewinsky. He refused to appear in person, but did give evidence over um, uh, a video recording. And uh, from my recollection of that, he does look very sheepish uh, to use an English word. In other words, he is not very confident when he's answering all the questions. So it, it went to show that actually um, he probably did really in the end accept what he did, but he wanted to reduce um, the um, importance of what he was doing with this lady. So um, to, to, to respond then directly to the question, it, 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 it may well be um, the individual witness themselves that gives themselves away if they're not telling the truth, um, either in court or online. And I, I would honestly say that um, it, it is not going to be an easy uh, examination and cross-examination for anybody. And then, of course, the assessment of the evidence is going to be equally as difficult as well. Um, so I don't have any easy, ready uh, response to that question, other than to say that we, we need to be mindful of the empirical evidence about the poor memory, but also, of course, people's willingness to lie, which is the real difficulty as well. Uh Sure. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for a very detailed answer. Uh, other two questions actually relate to the same issue. And the issue is submission of electronic evidence in the original form to the court. And if I may, I would like to start answering this question by giving mm -hmm. the reference actually to the guidelines, because the problem of submission of electronic evidence in the electronic form to the court has been very much discussed discussed also in the drafting rule. And uh, it's clearly written now in uh, guideline number nine of the guidelines that the party should be permitted to submit electronic evidence in its original electronic format without the need to supply printouts. So the idea behind this rule and uh, these questions what we have right now related to submission of electronic evidence is that legal systems 
and civil proceedings and administrative proceedings yeah. Yeah. should provide the possibility for the parties to provide to the court not the printouts of electronic evidence, which well, printouts, it's not an electronic evidence. It can be a source of other type of evidence, but it's not the original form of electronic evidence. And I think that goes also to the problems of electronic litigation, because not in each country uh, there is a chance to litigate electronically, to submit all documents, all evidence to the court in an electronic form. Uh, for instance, in, in Lithuania, we've been using such electronic litigation system since 2012. It's been working quite well. And it allows actually the parties to submit all a number of different files to the court, just original electronic evidence. So maybe Stefan, you could explain uh, what are um, the problems of the printouts of electronic documents and how important it is to ensure that uh, electronic documents are submitted in the original form. Very, yes, there are, there are two related issues there then really. Um, the, the first one is a matter of um, resources. In other words, does, um, does the court that you're submitting the evidence to have the uh, facilities to be able to uh, um, accept the evidence and then store it properly? Um, and I, I'm sure there are still lots of courts across the globe right now that perhaps do not have that ability. So um, that makes it difficult then to uh, um, obviously adduce the evidence in electro electronic form uh, unless there is a protocol between the lawyers and the, the court uh, to allow the lawyers to bring uh, their, their own devices into court um, to exchange evidence. Um, but those are practical problems. Now, if we say, uh, accept that there's um, just one court, just for sake of argument, that does not have the facilities for accepting this evidence, then if we take two scenarios, if we take um, the scenario where there's, there is not very much electronic evidence, um, then printing it on paper is helpful, but of course, as I'm sure a lot of people on, on this um, discussion will know, it does not adduce all of the evidence that's relevant to the authenticity of the document. So printing out an email is fine, and one can accept that if there is no dispute about the authenticity of the document, because all we're interested in is the content and maybe who it was sent and, and who received it. However, if authenticity is an issue, then the met metadata, which is the data behind the data, which demonstrates how the email was sent and received, can be obviously highly significant. Now, when I publish, print out an email occasionally, which I do, I do, do not know how to print out that metadata. No doubt a technician would know how to do that. But the email is, is going to be um, useless without that, that metadata if uh, the authenticity is, is published. So, so by publishing it on paper, you're not achieving very much. Um, now, if you're, does that, that's a situation in, in a small court where there are very few documents. However, if you've got a large amount of documents, and by large, I mean hundreds of thousands, if not millions of documents, which I'm sure some people um, taking part in this event now are familiar with uh, in big cases, then there is no way you're going to publish everything on, on paper. Uh, it would just be impossible. Uh, and then you would have to take a lorry to court and unload the lorry, uh, which of course is not suitable. So um, I'm, I certainly hope that the, the work done by the Council of Europe does encourage local governments in different jurisdictions, appreciate the need to provide more resources to courts to be able to do this and conduct it electronically. Does that, that, does that sort of answer the question as such? Yeah, yes, Stefan, yes, I think so. Uh, thank you very much again for a detailed answer, because indeed, as 
possibility to submit electronic evidence in the original form, I think that's a quite big issue nowadays. And that's why uh, states should provide the possibility to, to, to litigate in the electronic form, because without that, well, how we can submit electronic evidence in the original form. Another question which we have from Georgia uh, relates also to the authenticity of uh, the electronic evidence. And uh, as far as I understand from the question, the question relates uh, to the situation then the authenticity of electronic communication, for instance, is proved by the bailiff or an enforcement agent. I think that's also quite common practice in, in civil law countries when enforcement agents have the right to confirm that certain facts exist or do not exist at a certain time. So how do you think, Stefan, uh, the use of uh, services of enforcement agents to prove that you know, there is a message was written, for instance, on the chat, is it an additional uh, safeguard to prove authenticity or is it not necessary? What do you think? Is it a common practice also in the United Kingdom to, to, to use such uh, services of enforcement agents? Uh, well, um, in, in common law countries across the world, um, it's very rare for you to ask a third party to produce evidence for you. Um, so if we're in a, a civil litigation in England and Wales, by way of, by way of example, uh, then each party is responsible for uh, collecting the evidence itself. Um, now, of course, if you wanted evidence from a third party that um, you, you, you haven't got enough lawyers to go and, and ask them for a, a statement, then you may employ a neutral third party to go to them if they're willing to provide a written statement. Um, but generally speaking, third parties are not used that much. When it comes to electronic evidence, um, e even if you use a neutral third party, the um, authenticity of the evidence could be challenged uh, in any event. Um, it much depends on what the, the defense of, of each party is, is relying on, of course. Um, I'll give you an example, if I may, very briefly. I'll, do, I'll, I'll, I'll discuss it as briefly as I can. Many years ago in 2009, I was asked to advise on this particular point. It was a VAT fraud in Europe when the UK was part of the European Union, where um, they were um, all Arabs. Um, they had realized that um, a fraud could be perpetrated by buying some mobile telephones, putting them onto a lorry, and then having the lorry driven around different countries in Europe so that they could claim the VAT back from each country. Um, they never sold anything, they were just claiming VAT back. Um, the Indian Revenue in, in the UK uh, uh, then prosecuted these people. Quite a large number were found guilty. One of them in particular was uh, prosecuted in, ab in his absence because he was in uh, Dubai and there was a court order issued by a judge for him not to leave Dubai. Now, the British authorities thought that this was um, a deliberate ploy to prevent him coming to UK to face justice. But that apart, um, some of the evidence in the case was from a banking system located in the Netherlands. It was from a bank that was also in the Dutch Antilles as well. And they had, the, the Dutch knew that this bank was deliberately set up for criminals to launder money. So the British, uh, what the British um, Indian Revenue had to do in there to prove he was involved in this case was to establish uh, that the company they used um, passed money through this bank in the Netherlands. It was a crucial aspect of the proof, as you can imagine. So the British authorities asked the Dutch financial police if they would obtain the evidence from the banking system. Now, the Dutch financial police had to take, had to download electronic evidence from a banking system that was live and it was changing every second. So as you can imagine, the guidance that um, is issued by the um, Association of Chief Police Officers in England and Wales, and also the guidance that we offer 
in um, the draft convention on electronic evidence does not suit a situation like this. So the digital evidence professional has to rely on their knowledge and experience um, to be able to deal with the situation appropriately. In this case, the evidence was disputed. One of the arguments my uh, client wanted to use in appeal was that the guidelines issued by the Association of Chief Police Officers in England and Wales should have been used by the Dutch uh, Financial Police to obtain the evidence in the Netherlands. And I was asked specifically to advise on this issue. As it was, I do know one of the judges of the um, Court of Appeal in, in, in the Netherlands, and I wrote to him to find out if there was a similar set of guidelines in the Netherlands. There was, it's only written in Dutch, and it was also secret, which is really quite perplexing. Um, so I was asked to establish in law whether the Dutch guidelines should apply to the uh, evidence uh, as they obtained it, or mm -hmm. the English guidelines. And my view, uh, which I, I obviously think is correct, but I'd be interested in other people's views, is that given that the evidence was in the Netherlands, and given that it was the Dutch financial police that were um, obtaining the evidence, it was the Dutch guidelines that applied to the evidence, not the English guidelines. And then when the evidence came to the UK and was actually in an English court, then the person who obtained the evidence in the Netherlands could be called as a witness and could be examined and cross-examined on it as to the integrity of the evidence and what they did. So I, I, I don't know if that is um, uh, the sort of response you're looking for, but it's probably the nearest approximation I can get to uh, to uh, third parties. Yes, Stefan, thank you so much. Uh, also, we have one more question, which I believe relates more to criminal uh, proceedings, but also it can be re very relevant in civil cases as well. So as far as I understand from the question, uh, the suffered party, the victim, um, uh, submitted to the court a printout of the Facebook discussion, of the messenger discussion from the right. social media account. But uh, the victim part did not provide uh, the gadget, uh, the device in which communicate for which uh, which was used for the communication. Um, the other party submitted all uh, Facebook profile uh, to prove that uh, the, the chat uh, uh, that some information was written there, and uh, the defense party uh, asked the court to make uh, expertise of uh, the Facebook account and uh, possibly to take uh, the device in which uh, the victim received that communication. So I think the question relates how in detail should the court uh, analyze the authenticity of electronic evidence and use experts uh, also for examination of authenticity and reliability of electronic data. Well, I think in response to that, if I may, I'd um, refer to the, the uh, practice that the police now adopt in, in England and Wales, if that's all right. And mm -hmm. that would be, the police would definitely take a copy of the victim, victim's hard disk. Um, uh, if it's a smartphone, they would do the same with a smartphone. Um, so they, they would have the all of the electronic evidence to be able to use to establish the authenticity from that device. Now, it may, may be that that is not sufficient. You might have to then go online and, and obtain further information. But um, so, so uh, the situation that you've set out would not occur in England and Wales because the device would have been seized or and the data on it copied. So that would be available. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the situation that you've you've set out, which obviously is a, is a realistic one in some jurisdictions, unfortunately, um, my response would be that the court should be, if the parties have not done it themselves, uh, looking to um, um, getting an expert in uh, on the on the court's volition to be able to deal with this if it is such a, a significant issue in the case. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yes, Stefan, I also think the same. Uh, also regarding the court's role in uh, treatment of electronic evidence, uh, I would like to mention uh, guideline 17 of the guidelines, it's with, which establishes that courts should engage in the active management of electronic evidence in order, in particular, to avoid excessive or speculative provision of or demand for electronic evidence. And also the idea behind this rule, I think, was to highlight that courts in general have to take an active role in assessment and treatment of electronic evidence, taking into account the peculiarities of these evidence and that they are really very different from other types of evidence. But also uh, it, the idea was to emphasize that courts should know the boundaries how much digital data is necessary to prove certain facts of the case. Because at the end of the day, electronic evidence as any other type of evidence is used to prove certain facts of the case, if they exist or did not exist. So uh, the, the idea was to, to, to emphasize that courts should take quite an active role, of course, in respect, in accordance with all the principles of equality of parties and, and so on, but courts should uh, know how to handle uh, the peculiarities of electronic evidence. Uh, also, uh, we still have some time, so I encourage you all to, to, to write a, a few questions more if you have. But one more question, which I would actually like to ask uh, you, Stefan, is, uh, well, I mentioned a couple of cases from the European Court on Human Rights uh, related to, right, to private life and collection of electronic evidence. Yes. Uh, do you think that these cases, this Barbulescu versus Romania and that case against Spain, which allowed uh, monitoring of a private person, in that in both cases it was the employer to monitor digital communication or just working activities by hidden cameras, do you think from your perspective, is it really compatible with the right to private life and under which circumstances you would justify such monitoring? Uh, well, um, over two, de two decades ago, I, I, um, one of my first books was about email and the internet at work. Um, I think it went into about seven editions in the end. Um, and this, these precise issues I covered in that book um, 20 years ago. Um, and where the substantive law of privacy and human rights allows you, they all, there are always circumstances which make them not absolute rules. Um, in, in both of those cases that you mentioned, uh, there is an objective um, reality where an employer has the right um, to establish whether or not employees are stealing from them. Uh, but that has to be obviously tempered against um, the human rights of the employee. So this is where I think the data protection legislation from the European Union, which is now incorporated fully into the, uh, into the law in the United Kingdom since we unfortunately left the European Union, um, where employer employees uh, I'm sorry, employees are permitted uh, both to use such means if they have an objective reason for doing so, such as a, a camera to establish whether somebody is stealing from the employer, or um, where uh, you uh, can read people's emails. Now, the point about both of these is that the employer must let the employee know in advance that these sorts of things can happen and provide the reasons as to why they are adopting this as a mechanism. Um, and it, but the point is, I think certainly when it comes to uh, the use of cameras used secretly in the place of employment, that should not be a regular occurrence, not by any means. It certainly should not be a regular occurrence under English or a British law. And I, I'm sure that's the same across uh, all the jurisdictions in Europe and is also in, in the relevant data protection uh, legislation. Um, so it depends on the objective criteria. So we had the famous case in, in England of a chief, uh, an assistant chief constable who had tele two telephones on her desk, one used uh, for business purposes 
and one used for personal purposes. And the authorities uh, monitored the telephone for personal purposes, which of course was held by the European court to be incorrect, which of course is, was correct even then. Why on earth they did that, I do not know. Um, so it, 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 it's a balancing act um, and, it, and uh, many cases come to court because one side or the other has not actually um, balanced the, the rights of the individual against the rights of the employer properly. I mean, in the early days of the internet in the UK, for instance, I came across one employer who, without telling his employees, was uh, routing every single employ uh, email sent and received by employers to their to the managing director's email. So he read every single email that was sent and received by employers, employees. Uh, I, I told them that, that what they were doing was illegal, but um, they ignored me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, thank you, Stefan, very much. And I think the final question which we have for our today's discussion, uh, it relates to indeed a very sensitive topic uh, to domestic violence. And I think the question concerns uh, how electronic evidence, are there any peculiarities uh, of collection of electronic evidence in cases of domestic violence? Well, the example, what you, Stefan, mentioned, uh, in that case, it was the threat to the wife that the husband is going to yes. kill the wife. It's indeed a quite good example, I believe, of such a sensitive case. But uh, would you see any other peculiarities related to collection of evidence in cases of... Um, of domestic violence? Well, well uh, certainly uh, where it's occurring, if, if for instance, what the party that's being um, abused uh, manages uh, to put their smartphone on record at the material time, mm -hmm. then clearly that can be used, um, uh, providing it's admitted uh, to, to demonstrate mm -hmm. the, the um, yeah. The fact that they they are telling the truth when they they say they they were abused um that, that, and also uh, increasingly um houses people put cameras all around their house <laughs> yeah. and so if they're recorded of course that can also be used as well mm -hmm. okay uh great so uh i see we have no other questions then so uh i think we can end our the first part of our today's event if Julia would, would allow us to do so, what do you think, Julia? May, may I just, or Natalia? I think yes. that Natalia will speak now, yes. Oh, <laughs> Natalia, yes. So, so, so uh, please, may, Stephanie. May I just interrupt very briefly? Sure, Stephanie, yes. I know I, I'm leaving after this, and I'll leave it to you, Natalia, in a moment. But I, I just want to say uh, thank you very much uh, to everybody for listening in to this now. Uh, thank you very much to the Council of Europe for putting this event on. I am very indebted to everybody from the Council uh, that is taking part in this event right now for all of the preparations and our, our tests yesterday. It's been very successful. I thank all of you very much for doing that. Um, I, I also thank uh, the translator or translators that have been translating. I, I have not seen you or met you, but thank you very much for that. And I wish everybody a, a great festive season when it comes in a, short, in a few days. Thank you, Stephen. Um, well, I think we've heard all some quite interesting information on electronic evidence, some challenges that were mentioned by uh, Mr. Mason. Um, I also thought that the first in-time evidence information that was presented was quite fascinating. Uh, we also heard some examples of electronic evidence, including even domestic violence. Um, and I think it all illustrates the difficulty with the data provided and the complexity as a whole of, of electronic evidence. Mm -hmm. We, of course, heard in this first session uh, the information about the guidelines, which hopefully, uh, and the reason that they, why they were put together, uh, helps facilitate the use of um, electronic evidence in court proceedings. And uh, I would like to thank all the participants for the questions. I think we've had some interesting discussions um, based on those questions. Thank you for participating there. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, our uh, esteemed experts, uh, Mr. Mason 
for his uh, invaluable and very interesting presentation, giving this introduction on electronic evidence. And of course, to uh, Remigius Kubauskas for uh, giving some information on the Council of Europe guidelines. Um, and a special thank you to all the translators for this part of uh, the first session. Um, like I said before, after the first session, we'll um, break into the small, uh, we'll have a small break for 10 minutes. Uh, that will be followed with a hopefully fun quiz with some prizes for the winners. And uh, just to end, I would like to thank you all for participating in the first session. And for those who will leave, I would like to wish you a Merry Christmas now or in January, depending when you're celebrating it. And a Happy New Year to all and goodbye to those who will leave us and see you soon in 10 minutes for those who will stay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.